As we continue with the explanation of al hamawiya or Fatwa, or Futya, Al-Risala, al hamawiya Al-Kubra, or Sharh Al-Fatwa, al hamawiya Al-Kubra, by the great Imam, Shaykh Al-Islam, Ahmed ibn Abdul Halim, ibn Abdul Salam, ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, who died 728 after the migration of our Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, at the time now, 7.19 p.m., Wednesday, June 9th, 2021, which agrees with the Hijri calendar, was now or coincides with the Hijri calendar, the 28th of the month of Shawwal, <coughs> where the month, oh, excuse me, the year is still 1441 after the migration of our Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. As we explain in the lines of the great Imam when he answered the question, when the people of Hama ask him concerning the characteristics of Allah to be with the other, of what was informed only through the revelation, such the characteristics, or for example, the characteristics of ascension with the fingers of Allah, with the foot of Allah, and the hand of Allah, and the laughter of Allah, and the likes of that. We said that Shaykh al-Islam Tamiyah, rahimahullah, when he answered the question, he said concerning that, as we were discussing this last class, he said, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Qawluna Fiha Ma Qallahu Allahu Wa Rasulu. He says, all praise is due to Allah, the Lord of al Alameen. Our statement concerning that is what Allah and His Messenger has said. And the first and foremost from the Muhajireen and the Ansar, meaning the companions. The companions of those who migrated and those who received those who migrated in Al Madinah who were called the Ansar. He said, Our statement is what Allah said and the Messenger said and what they said, and those who followed them with perfection. وَمَا قَالَهُ أَئِمَّةُ الْهُدَىٰ بَعْتَ هَوْلَىٰ الَّذِينَ أَجْمَعَ الْمُسْلِمُونَ عَلَىٰ هِدَايَتِهِمْ وَبِرَايَتِهِمْ And also, what the, those who follow them with perfection and what the Imams of proper guidance, what they have said. <coughs> and after that, وَمَا قَالَهُ أَئِمَّةُ الْهُدَىٰ بَعْتَ هَوْلَىٰ الَّذِينَ أَجْمَعَ الْمُسْلِمُونَ عَلَىٰ هِدَايَتِهِمْ وَدِرَايَتِهِمْ Meaning the proper leaders or those people of knowledge who possess proper guidance. Mean those who follow the Sahaba. That they are called the Tabi'oon. And then you have after the Tabi'oon the Atba'u Tabi'een and those scholars that follow them who came after that generation in which the Muslims have a cons consensus upon them being properly guided and them being well 
grounded in knowledge. This is what is obligatory upon all of the creation in this matter. And other than the, and the other matters concerning the religion. That this is the principle that we follow. For verily Allah sent Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with proper guidance in a religion of truth in order to bring out the people from darkness or the levels of darkness to the one light by the permission of their Lord to the straight path of the Aziz al Hamid, the all praisey, the all praiseworthy, and the Almighty. And what they have testified, وَشَاهِدَ لَهُ بِأَنَّهُ بَعْثَهُ دَاعِيًا بِإِذْنِهِ وَسِرَاجًا مُنِيرًا وَأَمْرَهُ أَنْ يَقُولْ قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي أَدْعُو إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرًا أَنَا وَمَنِ اتَّبَعَنِي So when he's testified, meaning for the Messenger, that Allah Taala has sent him calling to him, meaning Allah, by his permission, subhanahu, and that he was that illuminated lantern, or that illuminated siraj, that illuminated torch, meaning that gave light to the people, in which Allah Taala commanded them by saying, "This is my path." I call to Allah upon proper guidance, me and those who follow me. This is what we were speaking about. We were speaking about these are the matters concerning why Shaykh Islam Taymiyyah Rahimallah that he gave a response to the people of Hama addressing the characteristics of Allah which is the category as I said last class called Al-Sifat Al-Khabariyyah the characteristics which were informed or was conveyed to us by the revelation of Allah. Meaning we will have no knowledge of knowing that Allah possessed those characteristics except through the revelation. As the majority of this book in which we will be explaining is concerning that category from the category of the names and attributes of Allah to do with Allah. We were speaking about, we were in the midst of explaining <coughs> that none of us know the true reality, or if you want to say, the essence of Allah to be with the other. It's way beyond our comprehension, and it's way above what we can fathom, and what our minds can draw up concerning our Lord, or what we can imagine, which is totally beyond that, that comprehension. We said, Ya Ma'ashul Ikhwa, that ignorance in these particular matters, it is ilm. What do I mean by that? Meaning, jahl of the kafir, how Allah's characteristics are, and how His essence are, and how His essence is. Excuse me, how His essence is, and how the true reality they are. Meaning, how they are. Those affairs. Allah Taala did not inform us of, did not inform how these characteristics are, how his face is, how his fingers are, how he descends, how he ascends. This is what you call lack of knowledge because Allah did not inform us of that. You'll find that the great Imam Al Sheikh Muhammad Ahmad Al Jami used to say, "Adamu al Idraq, yani Idraq, hakika." حقائق الصفات وكنهها وكيفيتها هو الإدراك فعدم الإدراك عدم الإدراك هو الإدراك us not attaining or fathoming the true reality of these characteristics of Allah or the essence or how they are they are or that, is, that affair is considered knowledge. I'll say it again. Not fathoming or attaining the true reality or the true nature or how the characteristics of Allah are, that is knowledge. That is ilm. As he used to say, when he used to sum it up by saying, Adamul Idraki, who is Idraku? Not fathoming it 
is actually what? Attaining its knowledge. Not fathoming it, trying to comprehend how the characteristics of Allah Taala with Ta'ala are, that is actually fathoming it. And that is actually having knowledge of it. So ignorance in this particular matter, that is actually considered knowledge. About how the characteristics of Allah are, the true nature and the true essence of how they are, is actually fathoming it by us not having knowledge of it. Because Allah informed us that He has these characteristics, but He never informed us of how they are. He never informed us of how they are to be with that. We talked about the qaida, which is al kalam fi sifat, fara'un an al kalam fi dhat, yahdu hidwa. We talked about the qaida or the principle. Al kalam fi sifat, speaking about the characteristics of Allah, is a branch of talking about what, or speaking about what everyone, His essence. They emulate each other. We talked about this last class. We gave examples of this. When we said, for example, if one was to be asked, or if he was to be asked about any characteristic from the characteristics of Allah, for example, how Allah's face is, how Allah's hand is, how's His fingers, how does His descension carry out, meaning how, Allah does, how does Allah descend, how does Allah ascend, how will He come on the day of resurrection in order to dispose of the affairs or judge between the servants? Your answer upon these questions, we would say, in reply to this, this is where we what? Apply the principle by saying, if you used to ask about these characteristics, then we ask about what? Ask that individual or reply by saying, how is his essence? Is? How is his essence? Is that? This is the statement of the Salaf when they said this particular principle. The Kalam was speaking about the characteristics, is a part of speaking about his essence. They emulate each other. Us being convinced or us acknowledging our incapability of attaining the true reality of Allah's essence. And the true reality of his characteristics, as we said, that is knowledge. Your ignorance and knowing the true reality of the characteristics of Allah to be with Ta'ala is knowledge. Is it clear what I'm saying? Does everyone follow me here? That's why we said, here in this particular matter, what we're discussing, your ignorance is knowledge, and it's knowledge that is praiseworthy. Why? Because you do not have knowledge of how his essence is. So it's all the more reason that you do not know his what? How his characteristics are. Allah Taala wa Taala, as we know, our faith in Him and our faith in His characteristics and the names He informed us of, as an iman or faith of what we said previously, of affirmation and submission, of ithbat and taslim. Our characteristics, excuse me, our iman and our faith in Allah's characteristics is an iman of what everyone, of of, of what affirmation of what is submission. Submission for Allah and the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, without trying to contemplate in the smallest amount of, of way that we try to now attain the true reality of these characteristics. For verily the text of Allah to be with the other sifat, for example, Ar-Rahman ala al-Arsh the most merciful above the throne ascended. Allah to be with the other informed us. After he created the heavens and the earth and what is between it, meaning between the heavens and the earth in six days, Allah informed us that he ascended above the throne. Ascension, which is a characteristic of Allah's actions, an action Allah did due to a wisdom that Allah knows and we do not know. Allah Ta'ala particularized the throne, particularized the arsh, from the rest of the creation by a characteristic which is called ascension, meaning he ascended above it, which is the which is the biggest of creation. And the biggest of creation is what everyone is the arsh. The biggest of what Allah created, which is the saf, the throne of everything created, the greatest of the creation. 
And that particular, or that fair, or excuse me, that thing which is called the arsh is above all the creation. Allah specified the, the throne or the arsh with the characteristic of what everyone? Istiwa, ascension. Not because Allah needed it, or that Allah needs the arsh. Because Allah Ta'ala is ghani, He's ghani, He's self-sufficient, independent, in every which manner. And we know the characteristic of self-sufficiency or self-independency, which is called ghina. That is a characteristic of Allah's essence also. So, just because Allah is above the arsh, as we said, does not necessitate that He needs the arsh. Rather, the arsh and everything in the heavens and the earth need Him. Tabarakah wa ta'ala. From the angels and everything that is created. Everything, rather the affairs, the total opposite. The throne, the angels, and everything in the heavens and the earth needs Him. Tabarakah wa ta'ala. For Allah Tabarakah wa ta'ala, that He's ascended above the arsh, He did not need the arsh, not before He created the heavens and the earth, nor after it. Allah ascended above it due to some wisdom that He knows and we do not know by particularizing that throne with being above it after He created the heavens and the earth and that which is between it in six days. That characteristic of what they call istiwa, ascension, is a characteristic of Allah's action. An action that Allah did. However, we say that it's called a sifa. Sifa is called a characteristic in the English language. Sifatun. Now, we talked about before the characteristic of ulu, which is aboveness or highness or loftiness of Allah, is a characteristic of Allah's essence. Meaning, we said that Allah is always above. The characteristic of aboveness or loftiness or highness, which is called ulu, is different or is in contrast to the characteristic of ascension. Ascension is a characteristic of Allah's action. It's that action that Allah did and Allah particularized the throne with that characteristic. It is a ulun khas. Ulun khas. The characteristic of Allah's ascension is what? It's a specific type of aboveness, but it's not mutlaqul ulu. That the aboveness of Allah ta'ala is mutlaqul ulu. Allah ta'ala, aboveness is a characteristic of his essence. Ascension is a characteristic of his actions. Allah is always above, no matter what time, when, and where. Allah is always above his creation. When Allah ascends at night, in the third last part of it, he's still above. When Allah comes on the day of resurrection, he still will be above the creation. And when the creation or the inhabitants of paradise enter it, when the creation, if Allah allows us to enter paradise, they, He will still be above the creation. Characteristic of Allah's aboveness is always, always, always from His essence to be with the Allah. Rather, the characteristic of ascension, you'll find that Ahl Ilm, that they call it Ulun Khas. It's not a ulu and mutlaq. The ulu of Allah is ulu mutlaq. Absolute aboveness all the time. Ascension is a characteristic of Allah's act. Ascension is a characteristic of Allah's action. Meaning, it's a characteristic of his action, which is a specific type of aboveness, but it's not absolute aboveness. Is it clear what I'm saying? Is everyone with me? G. Fine. Allah Ta'ala being above is a characteristic of Allah Ta'ala essence, his aboveness is, his, is, part of his, is from his essence. This affair, Ya Ma'ashim Ikhwah, has been established by five, by five affairs, meaning Allah being above us, by the Kitab, by the authentic Sunnah, by the natural, un, unadulterated, untampered with. Natural disposition, meaning natural inclination of the human being, which Allah instinctive, instinctively put inside of us at the time where we created. So Allah put the affair of Ulu, of Him being above us in His book, His Sunnah, 
the natural disposition or innate disposition of the human being, meaning his natural inclination of what he was created upon. His fitrat al salima which is the third, the fourth is al aql al salim by the intellect that has not been tampered with, meaning it has not been corrupted by the outside influences or the satanic influences of this world. That's the fourth. And the fifth is the consensus of the Salaf. And we'll talk about the meaning of the Ijma'ah. What is the meaning of it? And what is the correct position in regards to the word Ijma'ah? So Allah being above has been established on all of these affairs. Number one is the what? The Kitab. The Sunnah. The Fitrat al Salima. By the natural disposition. By the untampered with intellect. And the what? And the Jama'a al Salaf. Five evidences. You will not find evidences like this in regards to this characteristic. The book and the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, inform us of that. And the pure mind that has not been adulterated or tampered with by the outside influences of this world or the corrupted ideologies of this world. Allah, tabarik wa ta'ala, or the abd. <clears throat> that he has knowledge that Allah is above all of the creation. This is our position. We be believe that Allah Taala is above all of the creation, above the seven heavens, just as He's informed about Himself and what the Messenger of Allah informed that Allah Taala is above seven heavens, and above the seven heavens is a footstool, and above the footstool is water, and above the water is the arsh, meaning the throne. And above the throne is Allah to be with the Allah. That is what's been informed. That's what's incumbent, incumbent and binding upon us to believe without a shadow of a doubt. That Allah is above the seven heavens. He is not mixed with the creation. Nor is the creation mixed with Him. Rather, belowness, if you want to say lowness or low or lowliness, meaning being within the earth. That's a characteristic of imperfection. Being mixed with inside of the creation. Or being everywhere amongst the creation. Or the creation being within him. Or him being within the creation. That is deficiency. Being mixed. Meaning the creator of the heavens and the earth. Being mixed with the creation does not befit the creator. Not from the aspect of the mind. Nor from the aspect of the natural innate disposition of the human being. The fitrah or the natural disposition of what we call today al mantiq al meaning what our bodies say or what our natural dispositions say. That is what they call it of today. But however, what is called al fitrah, the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam in the hadith, the hadith which is in the Sahih, which is in Sahih Muslim and other than them, which is on the hadith of Muawiyah ibn al Hakim al Sulami. That particular narration. About the female concubine, Jariyatan Ajamiyatan Amiyatan. That that female concubine who was just someone from the common folk. And she was non Arab. She was non Arab. And she used to watch over the she was a shepherd watching over the flock of sheep when in Medina. For one of the companions of the Messenger of Allah who became angry with her and he struck her. And one of the, some of the occasions where, took, where it had taken place, he slapped her. He regretted it and he wanted to liberate her. So he sought consultation with the Messenger of Allah وسلم, for her liberation. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, Bring her in order to test her faith. You'll find that from the shubha or from the ambiguity, such as Hamza Yusuf and other than them. That they bring the ambiguity that the hadith al Jariyah shows that the individual or the Muslim, when he comes and embraces the fold of Islam, he does not have to give importance to aqidah. Due to the fact that the Messenger of Allah asks two questions. Asks two questions, and then he vouched for her by saying she has what? That she has iman. He said, Here it shows that the Messenger of Allah asks two questions. When within those two short questions, he testified that she had complete faith, which is to show that what? That
that we do not have to give importance to learning Aqidah and it's not a big deal. And why does all the people these days bring all this fuss? And why did they bring all these different types of riffraff and chaos over questions that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked, which was two, and she answered them within less than what? Maybe two minutes, in which he said that you can learn the Aqidah within less than 10 minutes. It's not that big of a deal. You'll find that the people of Haq, the people of truth, when they came in Uruk, to nullify this ambiguity and take this type of doubtful matter and destroy it. They, if you look in the hadith, the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it was not in order to teach her, it was in order to test her. So he said, Hamza Yusuf, that was for teaching her. No, the hadith shows that he was what? Testing her. He was testing her, not what? Teaching not teaching her. He was testing her. So the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, called her in order to be tested. To see if she knew about Allah, instinctively. Like we said before, she was non-Arab. She was not what? She was from the common folk. And she was a female concubine. Did not learn anything in regards to someone teaching her that Allah is above. Where did she learn it from? Her natural disposition. Her natural inclination, which is to let you know that aboveness of Allah to be with the Allah is also from the natural disp disposition and in innate nature of the human being and a natural inclination that's been instilled inside of every human being. So it's not just the fact when the human being is born and he's in this world that he has knowledge of Allah alone. That's it. Not only does the human being instinctively know that Allah to be with the Allah exists, number one. Not only does the human being have the natural inclination to worship Allah alone in that second. And to add on to that, the third affair is that every human being naturally knows that Allah is above. The proof of that is the hadith of Jadia. The hadith of the female concubine, when the Messenger of Allah had tested her, how did she know the right answers? It was by what everyone? It's by her natural disposition of the human being. We said she was a common folk, she never learned. All of that was by instinct, by what was a natural disposition that had not been what? Affected by any outside corruption or influences of this world. And this would be the case of every human being. If they was left in a lone or an island or a desolate place, all alone, introverted, away from the people, without any outside influences or outside corruptive ideologies, and they were just left there for a period of time without any type of any belief, Affecting what's their natural disposition, they will instinctively develop and be nurtured upon, instinctively knowing that Allah exists and that Allah is the only one that deserves to be worshipped. And they would direct their worship to what's above them. They will raise their hands, knowing instinctively that their Lord is what? Above them. So she, the Messenger of Allah, asked her, Where is Allah? She didn't study, did not what? Learn anything. Where did she learn it from, as we said? Huh? The natural disposition. Ignorant, common folk. However, look to the answer. The Prophet ﷺ asks, where is Allah? The Messenger of Allah ﷺ asked the question. In contrast today, you'll find, especially from the deviant sect called the Asha'ira, they do not believe that it's appropriate for you to ask that question. The Messenger of Allah ﷺ asked the question. So who do we follow? A person's intellect or the revelation? We follow the revelation in which Allah, like we just said, what Shaykh Islam mentioned, in the beginning of Hamawiyah. That our religion is what? Our statement concerning the characteristics of Allah is what? What Allah and His Messenger said. And what the companions said. And those who followed them from the Tabi'een. And the followers of the Tabi'een. And those who followed them from the Immatul Huda. From the proper scholars who possess proper guidance, meaning the knowledge of Kitab al -Sunnah. Like we just mentioned, some people will find it strange. How can you ask this particular matter? Where is Allah? The Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, asked this question. She answered the question by saying, what everyone? In the heavens, meaning above the heavens. The she didn't say what? Everywhere. She said, above the heavens, how does she know? By the natural inclination, as we mentioned. She said, then the Messenger of Allah asked, who am I? She said, you are the Messenger of Allah. 
تعيش في ضاحية المدينة. She was living in the outskirts of Medina, far away. But she still knew that the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu was sent to humanity and that he was a prophet and messenger. And that he migrated to Al-Medina. And that he was in Al-Medina. She said, you're the Messenger of Allah. She said, liberate her for verily she is what? She's a believer. We said in refutation to Hamza Yusuf that this hadith is not about learning Aqidah less than 10 minutes at all. The affair or this particular matter in this context was concerning what everyone it's about testing her, which is a clear refutation against the falsehood that he tries to propagate. The Aqidah is not that important and it can be learned within 10 minutes or less, which is absolute nonsense. If that was the case, why did the Messenger of Allah focus on the worship of Allah, which is Aqidah, for 13 years in Mecca? These affairs, like we said, stay away from these evil callers who are the callers of the hellfire. The likes of these individuals are callers on the gates of hell. That's why they come with these notions and you see millions of people following him. So the ibrah or the thing to take in consideration is not the quantity, but it's what everyone, it's the quality. So that's what we mentioned. In regards to this affair, everyone has been naturally inclined upon this belief, whether they be from the Arab or the non-Arab. It is not from the affairs that is, that's strange, that a person asks, where is Allah? And that a person not be reluctant, except you, that he or she will point to the heavens. And we are not like the Asha'ira that say, if you point above, believing that Allah is above, then you have disbelieved. Or if you point above, with you believing, or that you do not believe that Allah is above, but you still point to it, your finger needs to be chopped off. We're not like the Asha'ira that say that absolute nonsense. The Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, asked this question, so you're saying that his finger needed to be chopped off, or that the Messenger of Allah said a statement of kufr? So that's what we say in this regard, Ya Ma'ashad Ikhwah. When a person right now, person just comes to the fold of Islam, they just embraced Islam, and they was taught about how to invoke Allah, and they will evoke this person who is in a state of dire need, where he's facing tremendous hardships in his or her life. And certain affairs of life is weighing heavy upon them. What do they do? They raise their hands. Raise their hands to who? The one who's above. Because they believe, and their belief that, where, that what, everyone? That Allah Taala is where? And that He's evoked from where? He's evoked from, from above. And he's called on from what? From above. When you make dua, when you make sujood, when you raise your hands, you do not have any inclination of feeling that Allah is everywhere, or he's around you, or next to you, or behind you. You believe, and your, tar- your heart turns towards what? Above you. <laughs> that Allah is, a, is invoked from above. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears your invocation from above. Even though he's with you. With what everyone? By his knowledge. And by him, he hears everything and sees everything, and that he will answer your invocation, which if you want to summarize by saying, is all of the meanings of the Lordship and Rububi of Allah. He's with us. Not by his essence, but by his what? By his ilm, by his knowledge, by his sight, by his hearing, and his knowledge is everywhere, and he answers your invocation, which if you want to summarize by saying in a concise statement, by all the meanings of the Lordship of Allah Taala. All the meanings of the Lord, of our Lord Taala, He's with us. With us in His essence? No. His essence, He's above. However, we say He's ba'inum min Separate and distinct from His creation. Who do we mean separate and distinct? Meaning, He's not within us, or we're within Him. Meaning, He's above us. Separate and He's distinct. He does not resemble the creation. As it comes in the narration of Imam Ahmed, where he said in that particular other, we mentioned it said, he was asked a question. He was asked a question by Yusuf ibn Musa al-Baghdadi. Allahu Azza wa Jal, فوق السماء السابعة على عرشه بائن من خلقه وقدراته وعلمه في كل مكان. That Allah is above the seven heavens, above the throne, separate from his creation. 
and his power and his ability and his knowledge is everywhere. Al Imam Ahmad was asked this question and he informed by saying, He said, Above the throne, so the Imam Ahmad was asked, asked this question. It's in Sharh Usuni Atiqat Ahl Sunnah al Jama'a Bala Laka'i. That he was asked this question Is Allah above the heavens, above the seventh heaven? Above the seventh heaven, above the throne, separate from his creation, and his power and his ability is everywhere. And Imam Ahmad said, Yes, he's above the Arsh. And his knowledge is everywhere. His knowledge of everyone and everything is everywhere. His knowledge is everywhere. Which is to let one know another lie that has been made upon and fabricated upon Shaykh al Islam Taymiyyah that he was the first one to say, Ba'inu min khalpin. Separate and distinct from his creation was something that Shaykh al Islam made up, is a lie. We just clearly established that this statement was, was ascribed to who? Described described to Imam Ahmed, which is approximately maybe five to six hundred years before Shaykh al Islam Taymiyyah. He, Imam Ahmed, said the statement, Ba'inu min khalpihi, separate and distinct from his creation. So do not listen to the fabricators and the liars who say that Shaykh al Islam came with these words, separate and distinct from his creation, and he was the first to bring them, so he innovated. That is an absolute lie. We just established and affirmed that Imam Ahmed said this statement. And not only Imam Ahmed said this statement, from the great Salaf, who was also from that time, was Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, where he also said a statement similar to that. Where it was asked, Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, Bima na'arifu rabbana, how do we know our Lord? And Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak said, Bi annahu fawqa al-arsh, be as Allah is above the throne. Abdullah ibn Mubarak said he is above the throne, above the seventh heaven, above the throne, separate and distinct from his creation. Ba'inu min khalpi. Which has also been extracted in the refutation against the Jahmiyyah by Darimi that he mentioned and said about this particular narration, which we just said was made by Abdullah or was, was ascribed to Abdullah ibn Mubarak. Allah Ta'ala we know is above us by the Nusus in which we're speaking about now. We just mentioned and said <coughs> that Allah Ta'ala has informed us. Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah gave the answer when he was speaking about those ayat, the ayat of the characteristics of Allah. Such as Ar-Rahmanu ala al-Arsh istawa The most merciful above the Arsh above the throne ascended <clears throat> we said during the time of Imam Malik, Al Imam Malik, Rahimahullah, Al Imam Malik ibn Anas al Usbuhi, Imam Dal al Hijra, that he mentioned and said. He said, and we know Imam Malik was during, during what period of time, everyone? The time of the Tabi'i Tabi'in. Al Imam Malik, for, as far as my knowledge, did not reach the Sahaba. However, Abu Hanifa did. Abu Hanifa had reached some of the Sahaba, some of the Sigar al Sahaba. Not Imam Malik. Imam Malik was from the Tabi'i Tabi'in. He is from those, the, the time frame of those who followed the Tabi'in. Those who followed the Tabi'in. So Imam Malik did not reach the Sahaba. However, they do say that what? Abu Hanifa did. I sure hope you guys are understanding this because you might be testing on it. Just as the time of Imam Malik, that start this that the 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 effect of the knowledge of rhetoric and the knowledge of, of Greek philosophy, Greek mythology, and Hinduism started creeping in within a religion, meaning that the Muslims started to adopt some of their ways. That's how the speech of rhetoric came to cause confusion. Why? It was in order to cast doubt in the Muslims to render them extremely weak. So all the different types of Greek philosophy and Greek mythology, what happened to the Christians, and, the, and Hinduism creeped in within the Muslim ranks. Hinduism, which came as a result of it, Sufiya. 
Because Sufia is mixed with Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism, and the likes of, and the other than that. So the origin of Sufia returns back to imitation, if you want to say just to sum it up, of Hinduism. So Hindus in Hindus or Hind Hindia and Yunania, Greek philosophies started their book, their books started to be translated, and some of the Muslims started to adopt them. What happened during this period of time of Imam Malik, while these books were being translated of Greek uh, philosophy, he said, you'll find that an individual came to the sitting of Imam Malik. Everyone knows this story. When he, that individual asked, the most merciful above the throne ascended. He said to Imam Malik, how did Allah ascend? Kefistoa. He did not say, what is the meaning of ascension? He asked what everyone? How Allah Ta'ala wa Ta'ala ascended. Imam Malik was astonished by this question. For verily the, the Iman of that period of time, or during that time, which was the Iman, Iman of the Imam, of those who possess great knowledge, were stunned that individual would even ask this type of question. That's why Imam Malik, if you look in the other, what did he do? أَطْرَقَ بِرَأْسِهِ حَتَّى أَخَذَتُهُ الرُّحَضَى تَعَرَّقْ وَرُشِحْ وَعَرَقَ حَيَاءً مِنَ اللَّهِ تَبْرِي وَالْتَعَلَى He said that Imam Malik became astonished by the question. Startled by it. Until he put his head down and sweat started to emanate from his face profusely. Because he was thinking in his mind, how can this individual, this weak, the creation of Allah who was created not too long ago by, by some weak liquid of semen that emanates from a man. And he asks this type of question. When all you have to do is ponder on yourself, how Allah created you from something that is equivalent to what we think is just of snot. And that Allah can bring a creation from it. By which even doctors and scientists are still bewildered by the human body and how it operates. He said, how can an individual, that this is his state, how can he ask how Allah ascended above the Aush? And Imam Ahmed, this was his mind frame. That how could he ask this type of question until the point where he raised his head? And he said to answer the question, whatever you want, the ascension is known. Whereas it's known as far as whatever you want, the meaning of it. Linguistically in the Arabic language, it's known. How Allah ascended, what everyone? Unknown. It's unknown. Faith in it is obligatory to what? And ask concerning it is innovation. Rather, he even said in the narration, Anta rajulu su, sahibu bid'a. You're a man of evil and you're a person of bid'a, person of innovation. Meaning that you have now brought and opened up a door. That these questions were never asked by none of the companions, not by Allah, not by the Sahaba, none of the Tabi'een who followed them. Never asked, asked these questions because they knew it was way beyond their comprehension. And here you are, opening up the door of misguidance, asking questions that never came to their minds. How Allah ascended, how Allah descended, how Allah's faces, how Allah to be with Ta'ala, how's his laughter, and the likes of those other characteristics in which none of the companions of the Messenger of Allah ask those questions. And we know from our religion is that we ask what they ask. If the affair has been answered, then alhamdulillah, we've been sufficed. And we stop where they what? They stop that. And they never ask these questions. How Allah to be with the Allah, how He ascended. As we gave examples of this in the previous class, we mentioned by saying what everyone, one was to ask, why is this so? Taboo, if you want to say. Why is this so inappropriate? How is this beyond our comprehension? Because you cannot fathom in your mind something that can hear everything simultaneously. Can your mind comprehend that? No, it cannot. Your mind can't comprehend something that can see everything simultaneously. Everything in the heavens and the earth. Can your mind comprehend that? Can your mind comprehend that he has knowledge of what's inside of you? Your inner thoughts. What's going on under with the insects that you don't see? Everything in the heavens and earth, Allah has full knowledge of it. Can you comprehend it? Can your mind comprehend it? It cannot comprehend it. 
Allah knows what's going on inside of your body more than you don't even, more than what's going on with you and you are a part of your body. And Allah knows what's going on within it and you do not know. Can your mind comprehend that? Way beyond your comprehension. So if you know these are the characteristics of Allah, how can you ask about His ascension, dissension? These type of affairs, the Salaf knew that was way beyond the comprehension of the human being. How could you ask concerning these type of characteristics? For very young these type of characteristics of Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah, he goes on to say, for example, we have the verse in the Qur'an, as he mentioned, about the ascension. Then you have the ahadith, about the other characteristics of Allah that are khabariyya, that has been informed through the revelations, such as the fingers of Allah. Allah Taala has fingers. Yes, He does. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has informed us in the authentic Sunnah, through the authentic Sunnah of our Prophet Ali Sallallahu as it says in the book. What did the people of Hama? What did they say? What does it say in the text? He says, "Verily, the hearts of the children of Adam in the Qulubani Adam, bayna usbu'ain min asabi al Rahman." Verily, the hearts of the children of Adam are between the two fingers from the fingers of a Rahman. He flips it how he wills. Those characteristics, everyone, such as fingers of Allah, no one should ask, how is his fingers? Nor should you look to your fingers. Nor should you look to yours. Why? Because your fingers are parts, limbs, and they're some of something. The fingers of Allah to be with the other, no one knows how they are. Why everyone? Because you answer by saying what everyone? Because you do not know his essence. You do not know how his essence is. Allah, that narration where it comes, where it says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put the Almighty or the All Dominant will put his foot over the hellfire. And other than that, from the different authentic narrations. All of them are mere what? They are mere isharat. They are mere uh, affairs that they are bringing our knowledge and awareness to. And which is going to come in the full narration which we're going to mention inshallah which is in the coming lessons. But the people of Hama, if you look in your book, the people of Hama said, what is the statements of the ulama? And bring detail in this regard. Notice it says, وَبْسُطُوا فِي ذلك. The word basata, يَبْسُطُوا means to make, bring it, make it broad, meaning bring a lot of details. Bring to Notice they said, insha'Allah. Insha'Allah is not used in our supplications. The word insha'Allah is not utilized in our supplications. You do not say, Oh Allah, grant me this in, sh in shit or insha'Allah. No. You do not say insha'Allah when you make a dua to Allah. So the word insha'Allah is used in order to put emphasis on something. And it's used also for, for something that's a, a statement or condition in sh of what we know in statements. Also, the word radiallahu anhu. A lot of people know that the word radiallahu anhu is only used for the Sahaba. Was used as it pertains to the Sahaba. And that what is what we're accustomed or acclimated to knowing is that a Sahaba, or those who are other than, other than companions, would say, Rahimahullah. As this is just a terminology. It is permissible for you to say, for example, Oh so and so, may Allah be pleased with you. Radiallahu ank. There's nothing wrong with that. But however, as they say, مِمَّا جَرَى عَلَيْهِ الْإِسْطِلَاحِ أَنَّ التَّرَضِّي لِلسَّحَابَ وَلَا مُشَاحَةَ فِي الْإِسْطِلَاحِ However, it is permissible for one to say to an individual, Muslim of course, may Allah be pleased with you. For that affair is something that we're acclimated. And like we said, there's nothing wrong of what has been what established of a terminology that we're accustomed to doing, even though it's permissible to do other than that. <coughs> You'll find that we mentioned this said, Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah that he mentioned when he was replying to them. He said, what everyone? 
He said, all praises to Rabbul Alameen. Our statement concerning that, those characteristics about the fingers of Allah and the ascension of Allah and the likes of that, is what Allah and His Messenger and the first and foremost from the, those who migrated from Mecca and those who in al Madinah from the Ansar and those who followed them with perfection. Shaykh al-Islam Taymiyyah gave this type of praise to the Muhajireen and Ansar based upon the ayah that we know which is the Surah Tawbah, right everyone? طيب. What was the Sahaba saying in regards to these nusus, about these texts, about the characteristics of Allah? Did the Sahaba, when they heard the ascension of Allah, did they give a tafsir of it? Did they give a tafsir of it? Did they give an explanation of it? We say no. We say the tafsir of those characteristics, meaning the ayats that have the characteristics, such as ascension and, and descent, or, or ascension, or that Allah comes, its tafsir is us reciting it. Tafsiruha tilawatuha. Its tafsir is us reciting it. Nusus al sifat inda salaf, tafsiruha tilawatuha. The tafsir or the explanation of those type of verses that have in it the characteristics of Allah, its tafsir, its explanation is its recital or its, its reciting. If it's said to you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes, a person would say, give us the tafsir that Allah comes. How would you give the tafsir of it, everyone? How would you explain it? How? You would say by saying, what everyone? That Allah comes. That He'll come on the day of resurrection. Or a word that's similar to it, ja'a. Bima'na ata. He came. Nazala. Istawa. All of this is just merely reciting it. The tafsir of those words are the recital of it, or it's recital. This is just how the nusus of the salaf, this is how they used to do it pertaining to those characteristics. They would give or mention the ayah without giving the tafsir, especially what they call alteration, or bringing adulterated meanings by trying to warp them. And you'll never find that anyone from the Sahaba that they used to what? Give the tafsir of it, except which was something that was synonymous to it. By saying that Allah comes, meaning that He came. <laughs> that Allah will come on a day of resurrection, that He will come on a day of resurrection. How? Allahu A'lam. Is it similar to, is it similar to what? The, the human being, when they will be brought, and when they will come on a day of resurrection? Absolutely not. Notice Shaykh al-Islam to me, he said, also those who will come, on the day of resurrection, oh excuse me, also those who followed the Sahaba, I'm sorry, those who followed the companions of the Messenger of Allah with perfection, those are considered who everyone? The Tabi'een and those who followed the Tabi'een and the four Imams who came after them, of course, especially those who reached some of the Sahaba. Who reached from the Sahaba, the A'imma? or the four great Imams, Abu Hanifa. Abu Hanifa reached the Sigar al-Sahaba. He reached the what? They rather they said seven of them. Al-Imam Malik was from the Tabi' Tabi'in. Abu Han Al-Imam Malik took from Abu Hanifa. And Abu Hanifa took from Abu Imam Malik. So you find that the Shaykh took from the student and the student took from the Shaykh. Both. And Imam Malik was the Shaykh of who? Al Imam al Shafi'i. Al Imam al Shafi'i was the Shaykh of who? Al Imam Ahmad. I'll say it again. Abu Hanifa was the Shaykh of who? Well, first, now Abu Hanifa reached how many of the Sahaba? Seven. seven. Abu Hanifa reached seven of the companions of the Messenger of Allah. Abu, Abu Hanifa is the Shaykh for who? For Al Imam Malik. Al Imam Malik also what benefited his Shaykh. Who is who? Abu Hanifa. So Abu Hanifa took from Imam Malik. Al Imam Malik also, Al -Imam Malik also took from who? Also took from who? Abu Hanifa. Al Imam al Shafi'i is the student of who? Al Imam Malik. Al Imam al Shafi'i is the Sheikh of Al Imam Malik. Al Imam Ahmed is who? 
is the student of an Imam al-Shafi'i. Those who are for the A'imma, however, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah was not talking about them. There was a, the A'imma who are four, in which you'll find that Shaykh al-Islam mentioned in text where he said they were called the Imams of the Dunya, A'imma to Dunya, which is in the time frame of the Tabi' Tabi'in. Who's who? When we say Tabi Tabi'in, what should come to your mind is the Imam Malik. Tabi Tabi'in. As soon as you hear the followers of the Tabi'in, what should come to your mind from the Imma is the Imam Malik. The Imam Malik. Who are the Imma to Dunya? Who are the scholars of the Dunya at that time for the Ahd Tabi Tabi'in? They were, number one, the Imam Malik. The Imam Malik was the scholar for the people of Medina. Or in the area, what they call to, and still to this day, they call it Hijaz. Hijaz, which is what everyone? Hijaz, which was of, which is the area now currently where? Mecca, Medina. Even and during those times, Hijaz was considered Najd in Yemen at that particular time. All of that followed under the knowledge of an Imam Malik, which was, that area is huge. And they all follow Imam Malik. Meaning the people needed some type of fatwa that they were what? They were now saddle up on their riding beast in order to ask who? Imam Malik. The second was Imam Abdul uh, 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 Imam Al Uzai. His name was Abdul Rahman ibn Amr Al Uzai. Was the Imam of Ahl Sham. He was the Imam of Sham. Sheikh Al Islam also called him. From the A'imma to Dunya. Al Imam Al Awza'i. And his name was Abdul Rahman ibn Amr Al Awza'i. The Imam of Sham. That was the Imam from the A'imma of the Dunya during the time of the Tabi' al Tabi'i. Then you have Al Imam Al Thawri, who was in where everyone? Al Iraq. Which is in Iraq, in that area, and which is around Iraq. Al Imam Thawri. Or the Imam al Thodi, Sufyan al Thodi. He was the scholar of that region, of that area. And all of them followed behind that particular Imam. And the fourth is who? The great Imam al Layth ibn Sa'id al Misri, who was the Imam of Egypt. Shaykh al Islam called them a Imam to Dunya. During the time of the Tabi' Tabi'in. They were the ones who, the, who Shaykh al Islam had mentioned concerning them. They are the A'imma of proper guidance, meaning the scholars, in which the Muslims have a, have a consensus upon them being properly guided and them being well grounded in knowledge. Those were the A'imma al arba They were the four great Imams during the time of the Ahd al Tabi al Tabi'i. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? In regards to what we just mentioned, <laughs> notice that Shaykh al-Islam said whatever we want. This is what is obligatory upon all of the creation in this matter. Which is whatever we want. What Allah and His Messenger said. Which Allah and His Messenger said. And who? The Sahaba from the Muhajireen and Ansar. And then who? The Tabi'een. And then who? Tabi'i Tabi'een. And those from the A'immatul Huda. He said that is what is obligatory upon all the creation in this affair. Did Shaykh al-Islam say anything wrong? Did he say anything wrong here? Not one thing is wrong. Not one. For those who now... Is, Realize, based, based upon this type of foundation that Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah is laying down, it's not from permissible for anyone after that to now bring forth another method or path other than that one which he just established. Why? Because he'd be considered, what we want, an innovator. Brought something new in which none of the scholars of sound guidance were upon at all. Then Shaykh al-Islam, what did he mention to say, everyone? Verily, Allah sent Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa with proper guidance in the deen of in the religion of truth 
in order to bring the people out of the levels of darkness to the one light, by the permission of Allah, to the straight path of Al-Aziz Al-Hamid, the All-Praiseworthy and the Almighty, which he testified for him that he sent, alayhi salatu wasalam, calling them to this path by his permission, and that he was that, that enlightened lantern, or that light, enlightened torch, being a light to the people, and commanded him by saying, this is my path, I call to Allah upon insight, meaning upon knowledge. طيب, you'll find that we said, Ya Ma'ash al Ikhwa, the Sunnah, the Messenger of Allah, وسلم, in which those from the Sahaba who now had taken from the Messenger of Allah, meaning directly from his mouth, والسلام, of his and his actions and his statements, and when he والسلام, had, had affirmed of what is halal and what is not, those are the companions of the Messenger of Allah. That is now taking all of these affairs. And from them it's the tabi'een. And they were the students of the Sahaba directly. In which we just established all these matters. None of them different in the affairs concerning Aqidah. So do not listen to those who say that all of these uh, imma of the past all had different in regards to the foundations of the religion. It's an absolute lie. It's a lie. None of these a'imma, not from the Sahaba. The Sahaba never, never differed in the affairs concerning Aqidah. The affair as far as the ru'ya of Allah being seen is not from the affairs you'll find that the, that the a'imma say is from the affairs of the usul of, or from the what? From the Aqidah. It's not from those affairs. It's from the branches. How is it that the message of Allah, did he see Allah with his eyes or his heart? How does it affect the aqeed of the Muslims? Doesn't affect it at all. Doesn't affect it at all. Whether or not the message of Allah is seen as Lord by the eyes or by the heart, even though the correct opinion is what? Or the correct position is that the message of Allah seen Allah Ta'ala by his heart behind the hijab. Behind the hijab, it was Allah's hijab is light. Behind the hijab, and that he, he, Tabari with the other, addressed the message of Allah by making buying upon the creation the prayers directly behind the hijab. However, you'll find that some of the people about it, they'll try to say, see the Sahaba different aqidah because of the ru'ya. Because that the message of Allah, did he see Allah with the eyes of the heart? See the Sahaba different aqidah. No, they did not different aqidah. You'll find that the ulama said that's not the affair concerning the Muslims' belief. The Muslims' belief has been established and is agreed upon that all of the believers will see Allah on the day of resurrection in paradise. So, whether or not our affair pertaining to the message of Allah, والسلام, was not an affair that's concerning the aqidah of the Muslims at all. It was about whether or not the Messenger of Allah seen Allah in the night of, of Qisat al Isra and Mi'raj, meaning when he was raised above the heavens. Is it clear what I'm saying, everyone? And it does not affect the aqidah of the Muslims. You'll find that the great Imam, from them is the great Imam, the Sheikh Muhammad Ahmad al Jami, he even mentioned this. He said, He said, لَمْ يَخْتَلِفُوا فِي شَيْءٍ قَطْ They never differ in anything in the least concerning the belief. Alhamdulillah. Even though when كَانُوا يَخْتَلِفُونَ فِي الْمَسَائِلِ الْفِقْهِيَةِ الْإِجْتِهَادِيَةِ لَكِنْ فِي أُصُولِ الدِّينِ مَا حَصَلَ بَيْنَهُمْ إِخْتِلَافٌ قَطْ تَسْمَعُونَ الْمَذَاهِبَ الْأَرْبَعَةِ فِي الْفُرُوعِ الْفِقْهِيَةِ لَكِنْ فِي الْعَقِيدَةِ فِي الْأُصُولِ فِي أُصُولِ الدِّينِ كم المذاهب مذهب واحد he said, even though they might have differed concerning the affairs of fiqh, and some of the affairs of fiqh, the affairs of jurisprudence, or the affairs as ishtihad, that had no text, or the text didn't reach them, or they did not have the text of certain affairs of fiqh that they did not have at that particular time. Due to now those reasons, they might have differed in those, in those, those affairs concerning fiqh meaning from the branches of the religion, 
not from the affairs of what? Of the foundations. Nothing of different of opinion had taken place between them in that regard. You hear about the four madhabs. Before madhabs is in regards to what everyone? The affairs of fiqh. Not in the affairs of aqidah. Or in the foundations of the religion. Not in the foundations of the religion. How many madhahib are there? One. Because there is no difference. One madhab, one belief, one methodology. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi informed that. Reformed that to the Sahaba. Rahmatullah. None of them differed in that regard. None of them in the affairs of Aqidah, because we know, brothers and sisters, Bab al Aqidah la yukbalu fiha al ijtihad. The affairs of Aqidah is not accepted in it, it's not acceptable in it, ijtihad. The affairs of Aqidah is not accepted in it, the affairs of ijtihad. It's not acceptable in it, the affairs of one giving their own opinion of what they think is closest to the truth. Anything pertaining to the names and the attributes of Allah, you'll find that no one spoke about it except that they had a what? A text from Kitab and Sunnah. It is not permissible to talk about the affairs of the unseen from your own ijtihad. You'll find that Ahl Im that they mentioned by saying this Masail al Ghayb wal Matalab al Ilahiya, Ghayru Qabilatin lil ijtihadi fiya, wala majala lil ra'i fiha al Ittalaq. The affairs concerning Al Matalab al Ilahiya, the affairs concerning our Lord, about His names, about His attributes, concerning Him, His essence, and the affairs of the unseen are from the affairs that does not accept in it one's opinion at all. There are only affairs that's accepted in it the text from Kitab al Sunnah. It is not permissible for one to utilize their opinion, what they feel. What they seen in a dream or what they dreamt about last night or what have you. The affairs concerning Allah, which is the greatest of all knowledge. The greatest of all knowledge is the knowledge concerning Allah and His names and His attributes. The most greatest of all knowledge is, is, not, is not acceptable in it, what everyone? Your own opinion. Everything is text. When you see the Sahaba, Speaking about Allah, speaking about the affairs of the unseen, about paradise, about hell, and especially the matters concerning Allah, they never gave their opinion in it, ever. Because they, they, they knew that those were the most what? The most intricate and the most what? Sacred of affairs. Because all those affairs of the unseen are what? It's all revelation. Any text you see that the Sahaba gave about the unseen and that Isnad is authentic, it takes the ruling of a hadith. Why? Because none of the Sahaba will talk about the affairs of Allah, the unseen, except from what? Except that they had directly attained their understanding from the Messenger of Allah. That's to let you know how sacred these affairs are. And that is not accepted in these particular matters. One bring forth their ijtihad, their own opinion. In that regard. Is it clear everyone? Fine. Let's read what else was Shaykh al Islam to me that he mentioned and said. Fine, let's read. Any questions before we move along? Just time for the event to follow. What do you mean? What was the purpose? What so, why did she have to be asked that question about it? Because she was about. smacked. She was smacked by the one who was in charge or over her affairs, and he wanted to free her. She wanted. He wanted the owner of her wanted to be lib, wanted the liberator. So he told the Messenger of Allah what happened. So the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, said, "Bring her here." So he wanted to test her in order to grant her. The, re the reward of her liberation. So he asked her two questions. That was it. I understand. As, hmm? What? Well, I'm sorry. So if she wasn't Muslim, she wouldn't have been free? Say it again? If she, if she, if she didn't pass the test. 
Allah Alam. But the narration shows that when she was what? She was Any other question? Any other question? Well, that's after the Maghrib. Oh, I have another question. I want to ask you a question. We're given a chance now. Nobody be shy now. Once we close the door, that's it. <laughs> Usually, what's habitual is that some of the brothers write the salah. Oh, you know, I got a question with the clap, brother. We just gave the. We give an opportunity now. Tafadl. As far as it regards to the words of wa body, limbs, parts, you'll find that the people of falsehood that they utilize those words to cause confusion. Then you believe my, you believe Allah has body parts. For verily. The narrations, first, number one, as we said, body parts is in regards to us, not in regards to Allah. Even though we affirm the characteristics of Allah by Him having fingers, does not necessitate that He's like the human being, whereas it's considered body parts or limbs. You'll find that the people of Fasid, whether they be from the Ashahid of today or they be from the Ahbash, especially here in Philadelphia, that teach this type of confusion. What they try to flee away from so bad, they fall into it. What they try to, f to flee away from so bad, they fall into it. That's the reason why they negate it. They say to us, you believe, for example, well, number one, before I, I, meant before I answer that, just know for back in the time of the Salaf, the words that was utilized, as we'll talk about this throughout the book, it's going to come. The words that we utilize in regards to our Lord was all from the Kitab and Sunnah. For example, Allah is above the Arsh, or Allah above, ascended the Arsh, He created the heavens and the earth within six days, and then He ascended above the Arsh. Or that Allah is above the creation. And the likes of those statements which comes in 
Kitab Sunnah. The people who are affected by Ilm al Kalam, who started to translate the books of Greeks, Greek uh, philosophy, and Hinduism, and other than that, when they started to translate those books, they brought the terminologies to cause confusion. They started bringing words that caused confusion. From those words is parts or limbs. They started bringing those words. So words that weren't used by the Salaf from the Sahaba, they started utilizing them to cause confusion. So they started bringing these words and the people started adopting them and the whole goal, objective behind it was to cast doubt concerning them. Meaning concern, concerning the affirmation that Allah has these characteristics. Because once a person says, do you believe Allah is a body part? It's a trick question. It's a trick question. It's trick. It's, tri it's tricky. To us, the sunnah is not tricky. A person would say to them, what, what do you mean by body part? Number one, Number one, before we go about, before we entertain the affair of what they call body part, we never use that. You use that. That's the first thing you say in order to re rebuttal what they're saying. You say first, I never said body part. You said that. We don't. We affirm these characteristics by not utilizing these terms that you have brought in order to cause confusion. So we say that Allah has the characteristic. And we do not utilize body part or parts because that's only for what? The human beings. So that's number one. Number two, you have to say, what do you mean by the word part? Firstly, we, we rid ourselves of that word. That's number one. Number two is from those words, what they call, it necessitates haq and bata. Necessitates truth and falsehood. If you mean by part, meaning us, we affirm that Allah has characteristics and they're not like the human being, nor do we affirm that they're called parts, that's what we affirm. And if you say in regards to body part, meaning it's like us, meaning the human body that is part of our arm or part of a chest or the head is on top of a shoulder, that's for the human being. That's only for the human being only, and we do not affirm that for Allah to be with the Allah, because that's a characteristic of imperfection. That's what you would say in order to what wipe away that ambiguity. That's exactly what you would say. But first, number one, we say, however, you fell into negating these characteristics because what you're so-called trying to flee away from, you fell into it. You say we don't like, like we do not liken Allah with the creation. Type. So why don't you affirm the characteristic of finger? Because in your mind you think it's a body part, which is a human being. So which you flee away from, you're what? You fell into it. That's why you negated it. Is it clear? Mm -hmm. <laughs> These are the type of arguments you establish. And if I, I not, and I've encountered some of them, and then you will mess their head up to the point where they will get, you know, you know what, you know what? I, I, I don't believe it. They'll just get upset and they'll run away. You know what? I don't believe in this. You're driving me crazy. I'll say, hey, what can we do for you? You know, you just got to calm down sometimes and listen and learn. <laughs> because they know they're confused. What you so called trying to flee away from, you what? You fell into it. That's why you what? You negated it or altered the meaning. Just because Allah has these characteristics does not mean that He's like the human body or the human being. Where there are parts or limbs. Is it clear, everyone? Jay, we'll stop here for a second. Was, Abdullah, the four imams is what? The four imams are the Imam Malik. Al Imam al Thodi. Sufyan al Thodi. Al Imam al Awza'i, Abdul Rahman ibn Amr al Awza'i. Abdul Rahman ibn Amr al Awza'i. And he was from, from Iraq. In the, in the region outside, and all around Iraq. No, the Sufyan al Thodi is Iraq. Yeah. Sufyan al Thodi is Iraq. Abdul Rahman, Abdul Rahman ibn Amr Zawai, Abu and the Imam al Zawai is from Sham. The Imam Ahl al Sham, for the people of Sham. And the Al Layth ibn Sa'id is from Egypt. 
the great Imam, Imam Al-Layth Al ibn Sa'd al fihri the great Imam, Egypt. Shaykh al-Islam used to call them A'immat al-Dunya, the really Imams of the Dunya. Anything else before we stop? We're about to pray now. Continue tomorrow, inshallah. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdak. Mashallah ilahi na'ad. Wa sallallahu wa sallam.